Good morning. You know, in a world that uh, sometimes can seem so out of control, uh, it is great to come here or, you know, be here virtually serving a God, worshiping a God that has always been, currently, and always will be in control. So I'm Jeff Logston. Uh, I've been attending here about 20 years with my family. I've served as an elder. Uh, on most Sunday mornings, you'll find me in, the, in a regular environment serving in children's ministry downstairs with our fifth and sixth graders. Steve asked me a few weeks ago if uh, I would speak today in his absence, and he probably did so for one of a couple reasons. You know, one, I am an attorney. I've spent probably about the last 20 years uh, learning and practicing in the legal profession, and he thought I might have a unique perspective on his series, Kingdom of God Justice. Or alternatively, he may just be giving an attorney a chance in the pulpit to return some of the you know, bad attorney jokes and jabs he's made over the time. So we'll make sure to keep some time at the end for some bad preacher jokes or stories. And if you'd like to participate, jump on in. Steve has been speaking about kingdom of God justice versus kingdom of the world justice for the past few weeks. We've looked at the pursuit of God's happiness, which includes justice, generous justice, unlimited justice, fulfilling justice. Today, we'll be examining how kingdom of God justice is thoughtful. So before we dig into seeing how kingdom of God justice is thoughtful, I want to take a look quickly at our recurring theme of justice. The root word there is intriguing to me because just has two very different meanings. The first would be just as being behavior or action that is right or morally fair, and that's probably what most of us think about when we think of the term justice. But the other meaning of just is simple, plain, ordinary, uneventful. And I do have to tell you that in the Logston household, that second meaning of just, that's a dirty word. You know, it's just a couple more dollars. Just let me stay up a few more minutes. Honey, it's just a wall. How hard can it be to move? So I guess my internal alarm should have gone off when I got a text from Steve a couple weeks ago saying, I just need a favor. So in all fairness, I was excited that Steve asked me to speak about this topic and the, the central verse for our discussion of how kingdom of God justice is thoughtful is from Proverbs, which is such a great uh, book, so chock full of wisdom for so many applications. But specifically, in Proverbs eighteen seventeen, in a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. So there are many great elements here in this verse for wisdom, but the ones we'll be looking at today is going to be how thoughtful justice is patient, how it's open to new ideas, and how it's humble. And as we look at those elements, I do want to challenge you that justice doesn't just apply to those big themes of justice, of social justice, or legal process justice. It absolutely applies there, but if, we're, if justice is really being that behavior uh, or action that's right or morally fair, then that should apply to all of our actions. And our compass or our barometer for being right or morally fair should be that of Christ and his directive of loving God and loving people. So first, we're going to look at how kingdom of God justice or how thoughtful justice is patient. And I do want to say this morning that I'll be using some examples from the American legal system. I completely understand that the legal system has its flaws, it's not perfect, and it has bad actors. But for the most part, the system itself is designed to be thoughtful and deliberate. So when I did enter law school, I had the preconceived notion that the legal process and legal framework would probably be just a little simple. You know, that it was, I was a bit naive, you had an argument, you had a claim, you had an opposing side, and then a decision was made just that easy. Well, however, when I started to take my classes in law school, when I had criminal procedure, civil procedure, and then when I got out and started to practice law and seeing that the process was deliberative, giving every opportunity for discovery of the facts and the underlying information, to discover your opponent's position, to discover your opponent's strengths or weaknesses, the strength of your case, all that before ever stepping foot into a courtroom you know, I saw that it was definitely going to be a patient process. And that actual legal process would make for really bad TV, really bad movies, as there's no immediacy in any action. There's not the aha moments of people bursting through the courtroom doors. There's always time for contemplation and response. 
So when we look at kingdom of the world and what it says about patience, the kingdom of the world says react, lash out, live in the moment, be angry. Responding to injustices of others when when being patient rather than angry is certainly not a do-nothing approach. Indeed, the failure to respond of injustices can contribute to further injustice, and there's nothing patient about those who tolerate injustice just because they lack the motivation to address it. But kingdom of God justice does say to be patient. We look at Moses. When he first sees the suffering of his brothers and sisters, he reacts with a primal sense of justice. When he sees the Egyptian striking the Israelite, what's he do? He strikes out. He kills the Egyptian. He hides the body. Was there another way he could have reacted? Another way to handle the situation? Well, maybe, but perhaps his ability to be patient hadn't been evolved or hadn't evolved yet later Moses does have his encounter with God at the burning bush God bestows upon him the mission to save his people now Moses Moses's individual sense of justice and his murderous outrage is transformed into this sense of national mission he goes to Pharaoh again and again with those undeterred statements that we know of let my people go instead of lashing out angrily or aggressively I also want to take a quick look at the third parable that Jesus told about the lost. We had the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son, the prodigal son. So the story of the prodigal son is found in Luke chapter 15. And while this is a great example of grace and redemption and seeking the lost, I see this also as a great example of patience by the father. So the story starts in Luke 15. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, it was just one sentence there, but don't overlook what happened there. This was an incredible request from a younger son. He's inferring to his father that, you know what? Your belongings, your material, your wealth is more important to me than you. You might as well be dead. Now, the father makes his decision. What the father feels is just and fair. Then he goes about the process of liquidating his possessions to give their younger son his portion. This is not a request, and let me write you a check. This isn't a quick wiring of funds. This is a long process. Imagine the frustration in your house if you have a child that asks for a piece of dessert that belongs to the other. Pandemonium breaks loose over that. So you have now the patience of the father being able to step back and deal with the situation. Not only with the great patience for the younger son's request, But I'm sure he's being patient with the looks, the eye rolls, the exasperated gasps, the repercussions of the older son. The older son saying, why? Dad, what are you thinking? That's mine. What are you doing? But as we know, the younger son goes and squanders his money, makes a litany of poor decisions, and eventually decides to return and grovel for a place with his father's workers. In verse 20, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. So to me, this is a father in his wisdom, in his patience, who's been waiting for this story to unfold. He had been patiently explained to others why he would look earnestly on the horizon for someone to return. So we see when the younger son does return, the father immediately pushes the past behind him, throws a party like no other, welcomes him back without judgment or guilt. In verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Then the father, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So the father's patience continues as he defends his position to honestly somebody throwing a tantrum. But he patiently explains the why. He patiently explains the reasoning. It would have been much easier just to ignore that son. It would have been much easier just to say, I can make whatever decision I want. It's my money, my right. But he didn't. He was patient. So while the description of the story or the son as prodigal means wastefully extravagant, you know, I feel that we have a prodigal father here being wastefully extravagant with his grace and with his patience, even though 
the father knows none of that is truly wasted. So we've seen how thoughtful justice is patient. You know, next we're going to see how thoughtful justice is open to new ideas. So the kingdom of the world justice says, you know enough. Your perspective is the correct one and opposing views are radical and should be dismissed. Unsolicited feedback is an attack and should be viewed as such. You've got it figured out already. You don't need any more. So we at First Christian were lucky enough to have Lee Strobel come and speak to us just about a year ago. He's a renowned journalist, former, former atheist, and now evangelist. Lee is a well-educated individual. He received his undergraduate degree in journalism. He then went on to receive his master's in law from Yale. And at the time, he was a self-proclaimed atheist. Lee's quote, the mere concept of an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving creator was absurd on the surface of it. Lee seemed pretty sure of his position. After his wife started attending a local church and became a Christ follower, he went on an almost two-year investigation to prove her and other Christ followers wrong. Strobel interviewed 13 well-respected authorities for historical evidence for the basis of Jesus and the existence of Jesus. In his book, The Case for Christ, he explored questions like, Can evidence for Jesus be found outside the Bible? Are there any grounds to believe that resurrection actually occurred? How much trust should we put in what's stated in the New Testament? After his thorough and tireless investigation, he claims, I became personally convinced that based on the historical evidence of the resurrection, that this is actually true. While Lee started out his journey to prove his entrenched position that no God existed, he ended up opening himself up to a whole new idea of Christ and became a Christ follower. When we look into the word, we also see openness to hearing new ideas or hearing from others. In Genesis, we see from Abraham that he learned that he was going to have a son from three angelic visitors. One of those visitors informed Abraham that his nephew Lot's hometown of Sodom and Gomorrah would be destroyed. Abraham bargains with God. He asked God that if a certain amount of people were found to be righteous, would God spare them? We see in Genesis 18.23, Then Abraham approached him, God, and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep away, sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of the earth do right. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in this, if I find 50 righteous people in it, I'll save it. That bargaining continued. It went from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10. This back and forth arguing between Abraham and God saved Lot's family. We see a little later in Exodus, Moses doing the same. After Moses had led the Israelites out of slavery, They were camped outside Mount Sinai. Moses was called up to meet with God to receive the law and the commandments. And in that time that Moses was gone, the Israelites became antsy. We started questioning whether if Moses' God was the God that really brought them out of Egypt and freed them. So they decided, no, that God was not the right one. So they found their gold possessions, melted it down, and made a golden calf. When this happened, God took notice and became very angry. We see in Exodus 32. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I'll make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord as God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say that it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented, and did not bring on the people the disaster he threatened. Then finally, one more time later in Numbers, we see the Israelites, common theme with them. Uh, they got to the point of sending a reconnaissance mission into the promised land to see what it was like. God gave them instructions. They sent out 12 individuals. When the 12 came back, 11 
were completely beside themselves, figuring how can we get in and conquer the, these seemingly insurmountable odds. But one, Caleb stood up and showed his faith that the task was not bigger than God. That night, the Israelites started the woe is me. They said we'd have been better off in Egypt. Moses and Aaron pled with them and they received death threats. God then appeared in verse 10. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs I have performed among them, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Once again, Moses pled with God to save the people. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for their sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I've forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Now, I fully recognize that our God is all-knowing, all-powerful. He knew what was going to happen in those exchanges and in those conversations. God is eternal in his perspective and his full knowledge of everything. But this was not a case of God waffling his decision. You know, however, he could have used these opportunities to grow his relationship with these individuals. He could have used these opportunities to remind them of his power. He could have used these opportunities to let these people play a part in his plan. Now, don't miss the point here. If the God of the universe is open to hearing ideas or arguments or perspectives or opposing views, why in the world wouldn't we? Why in the world would we say our current viewpoint's final? So one other aspect of being open to new ideas or perspective is seeking wisdom and counsel. You know, kingdom of the world justice says that you know enough and you have a right to your opinion and to try to persuade everyone with what you have now without further investigation. So my initial perspective of justices, of judges, were, the, were that they were a repository of all legal information and all knowledge. But that's not the case. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, most are wise with a breadth of experience, but a judge's role is to gather all the information about the case all the facts and arguments and make a discerning, unbiased decision accordingly. As part of that decision-making process, parties will submit full legal briefings. They'll submit all documentation. They'll submit all historical precedent. They're going to submit written argument. They're going to have their responses to the other party's arguments. They're going to bring in expert opinions. And even after you've supplied the court with all of this information, with your arguments, with the other side's arguments, you then get to give the court the answers. You tell them how you'd like the case decided. You submit proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. And then you give your final answer. You submit exactly how you want the case decided with a proposed order. You know, judicial officers are seeking the wisdom and counsel from those involved in the case before making that final judgment. Now, a judge isn't bound by what's submitted in those cases necessarily, but that information that he or she needs is right there in front of them. We see that uh, kingdom of God, thoughtful justice, states in James, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So finally, we're going to look at how thoughtful justice is humble. Kingdom of the world justice says, let the world know who wins, right? You argue louder, argue longer, be more outrageous. Kingdom of the world justice is browbeating with whomever's involved with you. Kingdom of the world justice encourages a drop the mic moment. It implies the conversation's done and that I won. As that mic hits the ground, that loud squelching draws the attention to the conversation and the interaction. You know, humility is a funny and fickle thing. You know, on one side, expressing true humility is noble, but God probably prepared you for that moment of humility by giving you some humbling experiences which in many cases can be embarrassing and maybe leave you eating a bit of crow. 
I was lucky enough to start my legal career working with a great law firm in Indianapolis and after, uh, after my first year of law school. In about my second year of practicing, after I graduated, I was working with a firm senior partner on a complicated uh, business, high-profile bankruptcy case. Uh, the case had gone through all the steps I discussed earlier. All the parties had presented their briefs and arguments, expert witnesses, mediation, and were finally ready to proceed to trial after a couple of years working on the case. So each side would have two and a half days to present their side, <clears throat> call their witnesses, cross-examine others, make their rebuttal points. So after that week-long trial concluded, both sides being a bit drained from the entire process, the judge sat back, and before he took the case under advisement, because remember, nothing's immediate. You know, the judge is going to take probably 30 days or so to decide. He asked one question. What about consideration? Consideration is a fundamental element of contract law. You learn it on day one of law school, and it was a basic matter that the attorneys on both sides failed to discuss, address, and honestly failed to even see. It was in all of our blind spots. You know, I, I was able to chalk it up to a bit of, I'm still a newbie, but all the attorneys involved were clearly impacted. When we made it back to the office that afternoon, the senior partner and I had a great conversation. It was a conversation about mistakes, about growth, about reflection. The seasoned attorney at the top of his game used this as an opportunity to truly show humility to somebody new in the profession and it had a lasting impact. We see in James chapter three, verses 13 through 17, is there some wise and understanding man among you then let his life be a shining example of the humility that is born of true wisdom. But if your heart is full of bitter jealousy and rivalry, then do not boast and do not deny the truth. You may acquire certain wisdom, but it does not come from above. It comes from this world, from your own lower nature, even from the devil. For wherever you find jealousy and rivalry, you also find disharmony and all other kinds of evil. The wisdom that comes from above is first pure, peace-loving, gentle, approachable, full of merciful thoughts and kindly actions, straightforward with no hint of hypocrisy. And as we see time and time again, Jesus would have been the original drop-the-mic expert if he so wanted. The highest officials, the most wise of their day, continue to try to catch Jesus in traps and how to interpret the law. You know, in Luke 10, starting in verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you'll live. But he, the lawyer, wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? So Jesus responds to the who's your neighbor question with the parable of the Good Samaritan, which Steve discussed a couple weeks ago. However, Jesus ends his story with engagement of asking which of those described was the lawyer's neighbor? And while we don't know the tone of the question, I'm confident it was an earnest engagement. It wasn't one of sarcasm or one of judgment. When the lawyer did answer, Jesus gave him a call to action and says, go and do likewise. So those drop the mic moments, those winning moments always leave somebody behind. It leaves somebody left out. It leaves somebody on the wrong side. It leaves them embarrassed and probably more entrenched than before. True humility brings others along with you as you strive for kingdom of God justice. So finally, humility is being able to admit you've changed. The fear of others' perceptions of you, if you do change, can be crippling. It can be a crippling fear, but what happens if you do let go? God will use you for incredible works. We look at Saul the persecutor who became Paul the apostle. Saul of Tarsus, a child of the best upbringing, a Roman citizen, trained in the best Jewish schools, groomed perhaps to become even chief priest, was a true hater and persecutor of early Christians. According to Luke in Acts 8, now Saul was consenting to his death, referring to the stoning of Stephen. Saul had his, had his reputation firmly ingrained. Everyone knew him. Everyone knew what he stood for. However, Saul allowed himself to be transformed with his interaction with God on the road to Damascus. What people were saying about him how he was changed, who his friends were, that's all new. Acts 9, 21, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. 
I'm sure that those introductions were initially quite awkward between Saul and the other disciples. We know that Ananias was called by God to be the initial person to go and retrieve Saul. And Ananias did have that, are you sure God conversation? Saul's life was, life was flipped on his ear and God used him for amazing works. We see in Philippians, Paul writes, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining in the resurrection from the dead. Friends, the kingdom of this world's justice and sense of justice is broken. However, as we do our part, as we do the good works that Christ has set out for us, as we strive to be a bit more thoughtful, a bit more patient, a bit more open and humble and expressing of love in what we do, we can reflect a bit of that kingdom of God justice here and now. The great thing about the true kingdom of God justice is it is just that simple when grace is involved. There's no long drawn out trials, no interpretation of facts or scenarios, no waiting on responses or decisions, no fear of bad actors involved in the process. There's merely the response to come and follow me. Once you've responded, grace hears all of your wrongdoings and says they're forgiven. Grace says you've earned nothing, but I'll give you everything. Grace is a gift. It's a gift ready for each of us to receive so that we can start doing the good works that God has already prepared for us. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for your power, we praise you for your love, and we praise you for your gift of grace. We know that without it we fall short and true justice would be punishing. God, we ask for the power, we ask for the clarity to be thoughtful, to be patient, to be open, to be humble, so that we can reflect just a bit of your love through our actions. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen.